This week on Extracts, good blue drink, bad red drink. Living forever would suck, don't you think? It's the immortality episode. Welcome to Extrax, a podcast where we introduce each other to our fandoms one episode at a time. I'm your host, Aaron Klein, and X-Files spooky bitch. And I'm your other host, Stella Cheeks, a slut for Star Trek The Original Series. Each podcast, we pick two episodes that fit a cinematic theme, watch them together, and then record our feelings. Our theme this week is immortality. There are a lot of godlike aliens in Star Trek that could technically work for an immortality episode, but I chose the season three episode, Requiem for Methuselah, because, well, this dude is human has lived for over 6,000 years. He's flipping Da Vinci for fuck's sake. Here's an up top warning. This episode drives me fucking insane, and I will be doing, frankly, an impressive amount of mental gymnastics to justify Kirk's reckless ass embarrassing behavior in this episode. Buckle up. I'm definitely maybe in the wrong here, but that last scene, who boy, it fucks me up. I think about it literally at least once a week. It's like that TikTok video, like, what's a video that lives rent-free in your head? It's this. It's this. It's Spock acting recklessly out of love and saying forget, but it also is so fucking weird. I hate it. It makes me mad, but I also kind of love it, and I hate this episode. I I never want to watch it ever again. It kills me. And for this episode, we're jumping way, way forward, basically as forward as we can possibly get to the penultimate episode of the extended series, season 11's Nothing Lasts Forever. In this episode, Mulder and Scully investigate organ theft and discover a truly horrific cult where people stitch themselves together because they worship an old sitcom queen and her mad scientist partner. But she's so pretty! And look at how much she hasn't aged! Just ignore that man that stitched onto her back! No big deal! Lugging around the slowly dying corpse of your cult follower is such a small price to pay for eternal beauty. Am I right? It's a huge price to pay. It's terrible. It's a huge price to pay. <laughs> All right. Are you ready for it? Dig it in there, Mr. Spock? No. <laughs> I don't want to do it. You will leave my planet. Did you say your planet, sir? My retreat from the unpleasantness of life on Earth and the company of people. A quick-ish episode summary. The Enterprise is a plague ship. The crew have contracted Regellian fever and a fast-acting disease that has already killed three people on the ship at the beginning of the episode. The only known treatment is a mineral known as Ritalin. Not Ritalin. Fuck you, autocrat. <laughs> Luckily, they find the mineral on a planet, Holberg 917G. But unluckily for them, the planet is owned by a grumpy weirdo in a cape who refuses to help. Kirk goes from nice to I'm a fucking destroy your planet immediately, while Bones tries to reason with him by emphasizing that the crew are dying and have bubonic plague-like symptoms. Flint recounts the horrors of the plague in a way that almost sounds like memory, but he's probably just a student of history, right? Flint relents and agrees to help. He takes them to his freaking castle and offers them brandy while his robot, M4, gathers the mineral. The Enterprise is dying, but hey, we have a we have time for a quick nip of brandy. <laughs> Spock even joins in because he's feeling envious. This man has what appears to be unknown, authentic da Vinci's, but they're made with modern materials. Fascinating. Troubling. <laughs> The trio is interrupted in their musings by Flint and his young, beautiful, and brilliant ward, Raina Capek. You see that where this is going, right? Flint weirdly suggests that Kirk play billiards with her, and then he suggests he dance with her while Spock plays a new Brahms composition. Hmm. Flint seems to be pushing Kirk towards Raina, which is totally weird because he tried to kiss her before he introduced them to her. M4 returns with the right talent, except, oops, it's contaminated with iridium and therefore useless. Sus! Flint apologizes, swears that the M4 can make more without their Rillium. They just have to wait a little longer. Sure, not like the Enterprise crew is dying or anything. Kirk kisses Reyna and the M4 tries to kill him. (laughs) Thankfully, Spock is around and not led by his dick, so his captain survives. Scotty responds to Kirk that he can't find anything on record of Flint or Reyna and that, oh well, just reminder, everyone is dying, so maybe hurry up, Kay. (laughs) Spock also hits us with the fact that the tricorder reveals that Flint is 6,000 years old. Raina realizes that Flint is playing Kirk and agrees to say goodbye to him if Flint will let them leave with the right talent. Kirk refuses to let her say goodbye, though, because he has fallen in love. Well, you know, his crew is dying. <laughs> uh, Kirk eventually leaves her alone to find Spock and Bones and track down the right talent. But Spock tries to stop Kirk from following him because he has been paying attention and he realized that Raina, who acts super fucking weird the whole time, was not a real girl. She's an android. 
Flint reveals the truth. He was born in 3834 BC, and after falling in battle, he discovered he could not die. Flint has lived lifetimes as Da Vinci, Brahms, and many others. He built Reyna to be his immortal mate and manipulated Kirk into teaching her how to love. Not so fun when the sex magic is turned on you, is it, Kirk? Oh, also he has to kill them now because they know a secret. Reyna asks Flint to spare them, and Kirk has what I can only imagine is a psychotic break and tries to fight Da Vinci for the love of an android. <laughs> but, That's what Da Vinci would want, to be fair. <laughs> but everybody loses because the android would literally rather die than deal with these two fucking weirdos. They finally realize that, hey, everyone is dying, and they make it back to the ship just in time. But Kirk is super embarrassed, rightfully so, by his behavior and falls asleep wishing that he could forget. Bones gives a dramatic-ass speech about how Spock would never do anything in Sane for love, and then Spock does a totally non-consensual mind melt to Kirk to make him forget. Very regular behavior. <sighs> what did you think about this episode? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> here's the thing. Yeah. Uh, you guys both kept talking about this episode before we started watching it, and like Bobby said he didn't like it, and you were like, I've got a lot of feelings about this episode. <laughs> and so while we were watching it, I was like... I don't understand. This isn't as bad as I was expecting. And then I got to the end, and uh, there's a lot going on. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I I don't know how I feel. I feel like I did like parts of this episode, but uh, that speech that Bones gives Spock is so mean and unnecessary and also it's like he's completely forgotten that he's half human it's weird because it's like this is also pretty late season three yeah like everybody is acting crazy out of character in this episode it's bizarre like that's like the whole deal is that he's a child of two worlds and he like constantly struggles and like he had said early in this episode, like, I'm feeling this feeling of envy. And Bones is like, ooh, you're having emotions. I love it when that happens. And then you get to the end of the episode and he's like, you're a cold, emotionless piece of shit. And like, it it feels so bizarre. And, like, it's especially weird knowing later that they, like, share a consciousness. Oh, oh where he touches his face and goes, remember? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a very intense parallel. It, yeah, it's uh, – so that made me have a lot of feelings where it was like, what the fuck is going on with Bones here? Yeah, Bones is pretty chill throughout the whole episode. And, and then, then he does this thing and you're like, wow, dude, why do you have to be a dick? And he doesn't deliver it in his normal like acerbic, jokey, whatever, whatever. It was just like – It's like wistful almost. It's, yeah. Which is it's fucking weird. Very cutting. And yeah. Spock looks hurt. Yeah, Spock looks like actually upset by it. And then Bones is like, LOL, bye, I'll see you later. And like takes off. And then there's like, again, we say this so often. It's not subtext when he's walking over to Kirk. Like there is. It's there is a, no way to read this scene no, in a different way. Absolutely not. Like Bones leaves and there's this moment of like, I do feel love. I know what it's like to do something reckless for love. Fuck you. It feels like a fucking challenge. It feels like Bones yeah. dropped the gauntlet almost and was like, I know how to get you to fucking make him feel better. I'm going to emotionally manipulate I you. Yes. Ah, yeah, and that, like, and it's not like he just touches him and, like, immediately makes him forget. He clearly is experiencing the love that Kirk felt for this woman, this android woman, and then makes the decision, it's better if you forget this, which is super fucked up. And it's this very quiet moment of him, like... It's tender. It's very tender of him, like, caressing his face and then whispering... Forget. Yeah. And like, is it a really fucked up violation of privacy? Yes. Is it a non consensual mind meld? Yes. Is this a wrong thing to do? Yes. But was it also done out of this like weird misplaced, like, let me do something reckless for you, this man I love? Yes. And that's why it makes me insane. <laughs> and also, like, it is what Kirk wanted. Kirk did say to him, I wish that I could forget yeah. this. I wish I could not remember this. And so Spock is doing what he asked, but in a totally non-consensual way. Mm-hmm. Like, 
<laughs> well, and also here, like, season three, the way that I think about it, too, is, like, Kirk has been down this road so much of, like, falling so deeply in love with somebody and then having them taken away in, like, kind of a horrific way. Like, Edith Keeler, his fucking wife who was pregnant with with his child who was, like, stoned to death. (laughs) The episode that we just watched for Accidental Kink, like, he was, like, chemically altered to be, like, in love with her forever and had to, like, give her up for, like, so he's been down this road a lot. And, like, a lot of the criticism for this episode, which I agree with, if just looking at this episode by itself, is, like, Kirk acts so wildly out of character during yeah. this. And, yeah, he falls in love a lot, but it's it doesn't feel like he's actually falling in love with Raina. It feels like he's almost, like... It feels like he's lust drunk. It feels like he's lust drunk, but it also feels like almost like he's... It's like he's playing, like, a memory almost. Like, he he is, like... Putting so much of the like emotion, this is how it reads me, that he's putting so much of the emotion that he's had with all these other women that he's had these like very intense fucked up relationships with almost like putting it on this person and being like, oh, she is somebody who feels trapped and can and I can help her escape and I feel trapped and lonely and I'm just putting all this unnecessary emotion on this person and I'm I'm using her as like this a proxy a, a proxy yeah and then he and that's part of the reason i think i feel like, like he actually kind of has a psychotic break here it like, feels like a completely out of character break yeah it's so weird like i i've seen what like 30 35 episodes yeah, you've probably seen at least a season like yeah, all like, t- together i've seen a pretty decent amount of kirk falling in love and like experiencing big emotions and like this feels so out of character. It feels like he falls in love with her basically instantaneously. Right. It, it's he has this completely disproportionate reaction to the idea that they're going to leave her behind. And like even before she and says, Spock is like she's a fucking android," and he's like, "I don't care at this point." Yeah, and like the sh- even before she's like, "I make the choice about who I love and where I go." It's he's putting this on her Mm -hmm. of like, no, 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 you love me, I love you, we're gonna go off and be happy in space together. And then there's this like additional fucked up layer that once he knows that she's an android, like Da Vinci, Bob, Flint, Flint, fucking Merlin, whatever the fuck you wanna (laughs) call him, like Alexander, Methuselah. The fact that he's like, the reason I created her is because I have legitimately fallen in love with human women and they've aged up and died and then all that's left is the taste of dust. And Kirk is basically asking her to do that with him. Like, knowing that she's an android. I never thought about that, but you're totally right. It's so fucked up. Like, I know you're an android. I know you're not a real person. I know that you'll remain like this forever. And I'm asking you to come with me to space and watch me fucking die. And also, what's the end game here? Like, the Enterprise isn't a family ship at this point. And also, like... You have shown time and time again that you're not going to leave the Enterprise. So, like, what is happening here? It's right. like he totally fucking dissociates and, like, all of the, like, emotions and fucked up shit that's happened. Because this is, like, near the end of the the series, I guess. So, like, because this is episode, season three, episode 19. And season three only had 24 episodes. And so, Damn, like, this is really this close, is to, really the close end. to the end. So that's why, like, kind of headcanon wise, it's like all of this fucked up crazy shit's happened. They've been in space for a long time. And I, it feels to me like he has a fucking true, like, psychotic break, which is part of the reason I think Spock throughout is, like, pretty gentle with him. I feel like he's feeling it. And he's like, hey, um, just a reminder, like, everybody's dying. Um, so can you maybe not flirt with fucked the, up. the android? Because, like, we've seen in other episodes where Spock is a lot more, like, he looks Kirk in the eye and goes, Edith Keeler must fucking die. Like, yeah. there are times when he's a lot more intense and he, like, tiptoes around Kirk a mm-hmm. lot in this episode and then <laughs> steals his fucking memories. Yeah. Because he's like, you cannot function I can't watch you function like this, and you cannot function as a captain like that. Right. It, it's very bizarre. It's insane. It is just so out of character. It's so strange. Like, uh, yeah. It was a, what a fucking wild ride of an episode. I, like, don't know how else to describe yeah, it. Yeah, man, it's hard to watch. Yeah. It, yeah, that was rough. Yeah, it's really rough. it drives and like again like obviously a lot of my explanation is a lot of headcanon stuff and it's also because like 
I love these characters. So I'm like, why would they act like this? Right? Like, what is the justification for any of this? Like, yes, it's just a bad episode. But like, why? And like, also, when you think about that scene with Bones and Spock, and the like shittiness of near the end, this is pretty close to all our yesterdays where Spock loses it and is like, stop talking to me like that. Yeah. And that also feels like, because that's episode 23 and this is episode 19 and there's a bunch of shit in between that. But like that also feels like a big buildup of three seasons of like, I know that you care about me and I know that we have a relationship, but you have to stop talking to me like that. Right. And like that now with the context of this makes a lot of sense. Like, oh, man. Yeah, this, mm. <sighs> I made a note at one point, too, like, I think this episode would have hit even more differently if I didn't know that our theme was immortality. Because, like, obviously, the second they land on this planet, I'm like, okay, well, this dude is. And he was like, the bubonic plague and the rats and the blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, it was really obvious. Are you a student of history? I, I am. am history. You didn't say I am history, but that was implied. <laughs> yes. I am. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know exactly what she was at first, but, like, It's clear that she's fucked up in some way. Right. And at first you're like, oh, maybe she's just weird because she's been a ward that's like been raised the whole time. But she had like once you know she's an android, you're like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because like she she does like the blind person stare. Right. And she like holds herself like she's not so robotic. Like you could see why somebody would get confused, especially because at this time they don't have like androids, how we think of them in like TNG and stuff. So you would be like, oh, okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like, and the the robotic like people that they've run into, like in like iMud, which you haven't seen, like look like people, but are very like we talk like robots, beep boop bop bop. And so like she does, she is like, oh, something's weird about her. Maybe it's just because she's been alone with this fucking weirdo for her whole life. And I just assume she was also immortal, and so she's like had probably a thousand yeah, years. Good to, assumption. Like, not technically right <laughs> yeah and like okay so she's probably been alive for way longer than a human being should she has 17 fucking degrees or whatever and she just doesn't and she's herself has said like i've never interacted with other people and so like immediately something reads incorrect about her like you are not a normal human being and then to find out like oh she's an android yeah duh yeah. that that makes a lot of sense once you see it you're like, oh, a thing that I noticed for the first time this episode, because, like, again, I don't, like, go out of my way to watch this episode. Truly, really, like, I do think this is a better episode than Miri, but I would rather watch Miri than this one because this one drives me fucking insane. Because that one also is just, like, Kirk acts out of character in that one and it creeps me out and it feels, and I have no justification for that one. This one, I'm like, let me do some hand-waving magic here. Um, but I, there's a scene where she, her and Kirk are, she, like, comes into the, like, room outside of where the, like, old android bodies are and she goes... He's like, why are you here? And she's like, sometimes I just come here to find myself. And I was like, oh, fuck, because all of herself is in that room. Right. <laughs> Even though she doesn't know that she's an android. Right. Which, which is, is also f- fucked super up. Super fucked up. It's a really fucked up thing to do to uh, someone you want to consider themselves a person. Yeah. To, like, completely take that away. And, like, Flint's whole thing of, like, I wanted you to awaken real emotion in her. Like, what did you think emotion meant exactly? Yeah. Like, you just wanted her to feel horny, but you didn't understand that And then that they'll leave, mean, and then she'll be like, well, I guess my only option is you. Is to fuck this old dude. Like, it, the idea that he doesn't realize, like, anger is going to be part of human emotion is dumb. Really dumb. Yeah, I mean, there's that line where, like, Flint like makes the ship tiny or whatever. I didn't put in my summary because it's like truly like whatever. That's the MacGuffin here. He can make things very tiny. Sure, whatever. And it's like, I'm going to put you in suspended animation. Then I'll wake you up in 2000 years. Everything will be cool. And they're like, "Mm, pass. No, thank you. (laughs) And he the reason he doesn't is because she makes it very clear. If you do this to them, I will hate you. Right. This will ruin everything. And so he basically has no choice. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of feelings. A lot of feelings about this one. Ugh. Woof. Big woof. Well, I did my hand wavy magic and jumped through a lot of hoops. Like, you don't have to subscribe to my like, no, reading of it. I just feel so weird about it. Like, I don't know. And also, we were talking while we were watching it, too. You were saying one of the things that makes you uncomfortable about it is the way that they dance in that. And so yeah. I, I brought up while we were watching it, like, that cheek-to-cheek type dancing is how kids learned how to dance in like the 30s and the 40s because it was socially unacceptable to stand very close girls and boys you like couldn't put your arm around a girl and so the idea was you learned how to dance cheek to cheeks because it was the only way you could make like skin to skin contact basically and like 
it's creepy if you don't know that because they're just like smoshed up against each Even other. Even with that, it's creepy in this episode. I mean, <laughs> yes, it, with the like further context of how it fucking out of control Kirk gets basically. But like also knowing that like cultural context of like, not Kirk because it's like hundreds of years in the future, but like the writers and the way that they imagined that Kirk would have been raised. Like, yeah, it makes sense that this, that you're so it's called social dancing. Like, okay, you're social dancing because this is how you like, this is like a gross way to put this, but this is how you like smell each other. You like get like, do our pheromones interact in this yeah. way? Let's put our skin together, which is oh, like, do they send each other? <laughs> So it's like the. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's very funny. And so we're like watching this like weird experience of of Flint like forcing them yeah, into these he's like, like play billiards, and she's like, "I'll show you how to play because you're fucking terrible at this." Yeah, and like, and then let's do this like social dancing cheek to cheek, and like he's like forcing them to fall in love, but again, it's this like weird accelerated love that doesn't feel natural for either of no. them and like also there's so many like kisses where he, she's like confused she looks terrified looks, <laughs> but but she looks terrified but i don't think she is terrified i think she's just like i don't know what the fuck this is and it's just like staring but like, also like if you've never kissed a person and no one's ever kissed you and then all of a sudden they're right up in your fucking face yeah. like, like even if the feeling you can't identify is and she she didn't have emotions at right. this point. And so it's And she eventually kisses back, but it's also like fucking weird. Yeah, and this like it's so bizarre that like that's how they're awakening her emotions is they're like flooding her senses with yeah. like I feel like there's two different ways that people react to human emotions in Star Trek. Aliens who become humans and are like, yes, it's, oh my God, the feelings are so horny. This is amazing. And then like Reyna, who's like, what the fuck? What is happening? Like, I don't know how to process right. this because I've never thought about the fact that I could have emotions. Or the third option, wow, you're all very alone. This is depressing. <laughs> yeah. But I feel like that's the same kind yeah, of yeah, reaction yeah. of like, whoa, what the fuck? What you is do going- this every day? <laughs> you do this on purpose? Like, for real on purpose? And like, and Raina sort of has the same reaction as the like, I would rather be in oblivion than live through this loneliness of a human prison. She's like, you know what I would rather do? Fucking die. And then die. <laughs> it's like... It's the given, one time he didn't want the computer to die. Right? <laughs> he like literally talks this woman to his, death. His like sex magic and his computer killing skills really come back to haunt him in this one. <laughs> yeah. He's it's, like, I am overwhelmed with the sex magic, and also you have talked me to death. Uh, and like, I thought that was the last scene. And so when you guys were talking about the last scene and like, oh man, this gives like all this other context and like <laughs> blah, blah, blah. We get to this scene and I was like, okay, I mean like I'm uncomfortable and this like freak out about choice was like uncomfortable, but it wasn't as bad as I was expecting. And then we got the real last <laughs> scene and I was like, whoa, what the absolute fuck is happening? Yeah. Like, uh, I don't think I ever want to watch this episode again. Yeah. It's correct. Yeah. I'm glad that we watched it. I'm glad I have this context. Yes, because the conceit of this podcast is I have to watch every episode with you, even the bad ones, and you get to skip the bad ones. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Most of the bad ones. (laughs) But, like, I think that it's super important for Spock and Kirk's relationship, and I understand can you imagine being can you imagine being a like 1969 housewife that petitioned to get this show back on the the air and you have written the fanzines and you are creating what we now know as like modern transformative fandom and then you watch this episode and you're like kind of like okay whatever and then you get that scene I feel like I would throw myself out a window I cannot imagine because I have like reaction to like critics and stuff I cannot imagine what it was like to see that scene for a first time as somebody who is devoted to the premise like there is no other way to read that scene no. I'm sorry that doesn't feel like because there are a lot of things that we joke and we're like ha 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 gay 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 but like there are arguments to be made about like good deep profound friendship whatever whatever I'm sorry there is no other way to read that scene 
Bones literally gives a speech like, you would never do anything crazy for love. You don't get it. And he was like, let me, a, a word? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I, I was saying when. Uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, I just no, was a, like. <laughs> no, I it's it's like when. I know that you haven't watched Mad Men, but one of my... I saw one season. The, yeah, but you didn't even get to my favorite character. And my two favorite characters finally get together. Spoiler, very big spoiler. At the end of Mad Men, they like finally... can spoil No, Mad I know. Men. But <laughs> they finally get together at the end. And I spent seven seasons being like, I want this character to get together with someone who she like deserves to be with because she's like a huge part of this series and her character is very important and then she gets and then when you meet the character she winds up with immediately I was like those two I want those two to be together and I spent seasons seasons being like god if they don't fucking get together by the end of this and it's literally like the second to last scene in the entire series I lost my shit I flipped the fuck out when they finally got together and that's how I imagine it must have felt to watch this show where it's like I've spent three seasons falling in love with the idea of these two being together I'm obsessed with this idea I'm like part of the forefront of transformative fiction and then you get that like there is no other way to read it It, there's no other way to read that scene you can read it as like this is really non-consensual and not great because like that is also true but like the motivation behind his actions Spock's actions specifically I, I don't know how you could read it any other way. And, like, the fact that then later Kirk goes on to, like, blow up a planet for him and, like, I'm devoted to this man yeah, and, yeah. like, I will literally sacrifice everything to save this person. Like, yeah, I can see where the seeds of that are in this fucking scene. Like, I don't understand. That's why I can't write this episode off as a this episode is bad or unimportant or whatever. Like, if somebody – like – Again, Miri is my least favorite episode. I think it's terrible. Like, I don't think you ever need to watch that. There's some funny bone, like, spoon stuff in it, but, like, you don't need to watch that ever. There's nothing that, like, has ripple effects. Like, eh, whatever. That could not exist, and all of fandom would still be the same. This feels very important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's just icky. <laughs> it's so icky. It's so icky. And I'm like, ugh, fuck. Yeah. Ugh. They did cure that plague, though. So they did. Clear, that's true. They did cure the plague. <laughs> Everyone on the ship lived, except for those three assumedly red shirts who died. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, awful, awful. And like we find out at the end that Merlin is dying. Like because he left Earth, he's like actually degenerating. Maybe, maybe not. There's like there's. Raina and, and Flint show up in a lot of things, canon and non-canon, like written things, like whatever. And like in at least one of them, it's like, nah, he just tricked them into thinking he was dying so they would leave him alone. But maybe he did die. I don't know. There's like a lot of – because Flint isn't – the idea of Flint and Raina are interesting characters. I guess Raina's fucking dead now, but he could have rebuilt her. So I was just going to say, Android. like, he has all of these other Raynas yeah. that he like figured out the formula for how to make her work basically and like – there is nothing stopping him from recreating her. Yeah. Like, and like, yeah, he has to reteach her all that stuff, but he's immortal. So like, oh, right. well, whatever. What exactly. else is he going to do? But like, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting idea, interesting character. Like you live for so long and sometimes you live your life unremarkably, but sometimes you're fucking Brahms. Like, yeah. And also like when you have the time to live 6,000 years, like, of course you're going to become a genius. Of course you're going to become a master painter of course you're going to become a master composer you have nothing but time and like that's all talent is it a certain extent yeah. like you have natural talent of course and some people have like a lot of natural talent but really what it is is training and time right and like the and a room of one's own <laughs> <laughs> of a course. castle of one's own <laughs> yes <laughs> a whole planet of one's own honestly yeah. like he it, bought that fucking planet like he did have rights to be like get off my planet yeah. I do own this planet exactly <laughs> it's, uh, yeah it's I now understand what you guys were talking about before we started watching this episode. Yeah. That was rough. Here's some fan lore. Sure. <laughs> and then interesting facts. So Reina's name is Reina Kapek, and it was she was named after for a Czechoslovakian writer, Carol Kapek, who first coined the term robot. So it's like a little shout out to be like, because she's a fucking robot. <laughs> interesting. Obviously, this has big ties to the Tempest with like the idea of like, a Prospero type character and then like a young, you know, daughter Miranda type character yeah. and also like Methuselah 
was the person in the Bible who lived like the longest and like a natural long life. And Requiem is like a Catholic term for like a, a mass for the dead. We love a play on words here at Star Trek. <laughs> so in Bixby's first draft, Flint was revealed to also have been Jesus, Moses, and Pablo Picasso. And NBC's broadcast was like, yeah, you can't say he was Jesus and, Meth- and Moses. Like, no. Methuselah, sure, fine. You can't say he was Jesus. No. <laughs> That's not going to fly. And then they also, somebody else nixed Picasso because, oh, I think the researcher, Joan Pierce, was like, yeah, he's still alive. And attributing fictitious work of art to a living artist is like, maybe not a great idea. Yeah, <laughs> so no. we don't really want to fuck with that at all. Um, so maybe just do Merlin, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that seems safer. So the actress, I thought this was really funny. I want to read this quote. The actress who plays Reina is Louise Sorel. She's like a big theater actress. And then the actor who played Flint was also a big theater actress, James Daly. And she has this hilarious quote where she says, They put me in this funny costume. I stood still and they wrapped fabric around me. And I had Annette Funicello Buffant and Dusty Springfield eye makeup. James Daly and I thought of ourselves as these two very serious theater actors. And we just kept looking at each other and saying, Why on earth are we doing this? Eventually, we started saying Christmas money, Christmas money, Christmas money. Overall, however, Sorrel, okay, that's a quote. And then it says, overall, how she remembered it as, quote, really very sweet. And I loved working with Shatner. We had played lovers once before. In the story, Flint forgot to give Raina the tools to survive emotionally. And when she and Kirk, and when he and Kirk started fighting over her, she just couldn't bear the pain. I thought it was very touching, (laughs) which I was like, okay, weird read, but also hilarious to be like, Christmas money, Christmas money. Oh, I'll kiss Shatner. Sure, that works for me. <laughs> um, so the show that they appeared to, on together was an episode of Route 66. It's called Build Your Houses with Their Backs to the Sea. Also starring in Route 66 was Glenn Corbett, who played Zephram Cochran in the last episode that we just watched. Oh. And also, as I was watching this, so like for to prep for this, obviously, like we... I watch the shows and we do two recordings in a day. And when I was watching Metamorphosis, I was like, oh, there's a lot of weird immortality shit in this one, too. Yeah. That's interesting. And so we've done these like two kind of back to back different ideas and versions of immortality and also these two like very different like fucked up love stories. Yeah. Yeah, there's this, it was a weird recording day. <laughs> it's a weird recording day. It was also weird for me to watch those episodes back to back for my notes. And I was like, well, I'm, oh, I hate this. <laughs> and also, like, we talked about this in the last episode of Extract, too, about, like, immortality isn't good. No. Like, no, no, no. It would actually be horrific to be alive forever. And, like, in that one, Zephram's only been alive for, like, he's additionally alive for 150 so, like, years. Like, 150 plus 87. I don't want to do some math, but that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> he's, like, 200 plus years old, which is a lot. It's right. too long to be alive. And he'll live to like, you know, two, he's like pretty young, so he'll probably live 250, maybe close to 300. So like a lifespan of like a Vulcan. Right, yeah, which is, okay, that's fine. That's like a, a set in this universe that that's like an acceptable amount of time to be alive. 6,000 years is too fucking long. Yeah. And like, I can see how that would rot your brain. Like, it doesn't matter that you're a genius 18 times over and you can do all of this amazing stuff. Like, I understand. And to watch everybody you've known. What does he say? He says, I've seen a, a, a hundred billion people die. Yeah. Like, I don't give a shit about your 400, 400 people. people. Yeah, exactly. Like, that uh, it all, I understand and empathize with the fact that he's like, I desperately need someone who will stay alive with me. Like, yeah, I fucking get it, dude. Like, it is not a fate I would wish on anybody, honestly. Like, immortality seems like the worst fucking curse you could give a person. Yeah. And this feels like a great example of that. <laughs> yeah, Ugh. man. This episode really does a number on me. <laughs> and I would like to stop talking about it. <laughs> if that's okay with you. That's fine. You want to do synopsis showdown? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I wrote two because I really didn't know how to like sum this up. So the first one is Kirk battles an immortal man for the love of an android and loses. But hey, at least they remember to cure the crew of the Enterprise from fucking dying. And then I wrote, Bones accuses Spock of not understanding doing insane things for love. And then Spock says, oh, word, and then does an insane thing to the man he loves. Uh, Yeah. The triumvirate go on a mining expedition to save the crew from certain death. Kirk goes out of his mind in love with a clearly non-human woman, fights an old immortal man. Bone gives Spock an extremely depressing lecture on his inability to love. And then Spock wipes Kirk's brain of the whole ordeal because fuck you, Bones. I do know what love is. (laughs) 
Ugh. Ugh. I want to pull my eyelashes out. Let's never talk about this episode again. Okay, but you'll think about it until the day you die. <laughs> yeah, I will. Thanks. <laughs> Are you ready for Mulder, It's Me? Because I'm not. I'm ready to not talk about this episode anymore, so I guess I'm ready. <laughs> okay. You know, sometimes I wonder why we keep doing it, Scully, in the face of all this indifference and presbyopia. Did you get your hair cut? Are you kidding me? Quick-ish summary, I guess. <laughs> I love how rageful you are. I'm... I told you, that's why I was like, all week you were like, you got to get your notes in, and I was like, I don't want to. <laughs> I really don't want to. <laughs> I get it now. <laughs> I truly understand now. Ugh, okay. All right. Two sketchy surgeons are operating on a patient when a woman barges in, martyrs them dead, steals the organs, and delivers them to a local hospital with a cryptic message. Mulder and Scully, of course, are like, hell yeah, ritual killing. This is our shit. But the police believe it's actually linked to an organ theft ring. Then they go to a church and chat out their theories and debate the nature of faith because I guess that's how they flirt and do foreplay now that they're in their 50s. Mulder, of course, notices that the weapons used to kill the surgeons match missing bars from this exact church's fence. So, of course, Mulder is like, hot damn, maybe we got a demon murder. <laughs> After chatting with a priest, they're led to the woman who killed the surgeons, Juliet, who informs the agents that her sister Olivia has joined a cult and her mother is unhappy about it. <laughs> Cut to the cult, whose leader, the reclusive 60s TV star Barbara Beaumont, is receiving the stolen organs in order to eat them as they've discovered that this helps stem the aging process. Oh, by the way, Barbara's like 85 years old and still appears to be 30, so I guess it's working, but not well enough because her partner, Randolph, has figured out an even better way to reverse the aging process and it's to surgically combine themselves with the cult followers and parasitically drain their life away. So the new plan for the cult is for the cult members to eat the organs and receive the benefits of anti-aging to eventually be hooked up to their cult leader and achieve the ultimate nirvana of keeping this old bitch alive for a little bit longer. However, the organs stolen from the hospital are not enough to feed the now entire enormous cult. So one of the cult members offers himself as a sacrifice, stabs the fuck out of himself and is promptly eaten alive. While she sings, it's quite a scene, to be honest. <laughs> with a good shirt. Yeah, with a great shirt. <laughs> Using some trickery and tracking devices, Scully and Mulder track the stolen organs to the Beaumont cult house, unaware that Juliet is also there. Randolph, who is now aging quickly because he doesn't have anyone attached to him, seems like a real downside to eternal youth, if I'm being honest. Also, she fucking cuts his life force away from him, which is super fucked up, decides to attach himself to Juliet's sister, Olivia. Once inside, the agents are overpowered by the cult followers who yeet Scully down an elevator shaft. Juliet stakes Beaumont through the heart, which causes the cult followers to get a terminal sad, I guess, allowing <laughs> Mulder to just escape a yeeting. While Mulder is searching for Scully, he's confronted by Randolph, who is now in peak condition, you know, other than the woman attached to his ass, and tells Mulder that he's cured the disease of aging. Olivia's like, fuck yeah, I'm a believer. Until she starts having a seizure, causing Mulder to be like, what the fuck? We've <laughs> got to get this woman to a hospital. Randolph threatens to cut Olivia's throat, but surprise, bitch! Juliet hammers him to death and then surrenders herself to Mulder. Oh, by the way, Scully's fine, as roughly a story of garbage discarded by the cult broke her fall. You know, actual immortality and all. <laughs> in the end, Olivia goes home to her mom, who is now sad about her other daughter, who's in prison. And Mulder and Scully return to the church to flirt about faith some more, where Mulder reveals he's not an atheist because of lack of faith. He's an atheist because he doesn't need faith because he has her. I'm not crying, you're crying! How did you feel about this episode? Well, considering it had two of my least favorite things and things that trigger me a lot and made me, I didn't watch a lot of this episode because I was just looking at the wall or my computer being like, mm -hmm, these are sounds I don't love. <laughs> Not good, but it was a good episode. <laughs> So, like, we all know that I don't like when things occupy the same space. It's not totally the same thing where, like, it's this multidimensional thing. But, like, obviously having these two humans attached to each other's backs like that was not good for me. I did not enjoy it. I mean, I don't think it's good for most people, but I did not um, enjoy it. I also want to make it clear. I know I've said this a lot, but, like... The idea of, like, conjoined twins and stuff doesn't, like, scare me. And I don't want anybody to, like, feel like I'm being shitty about that. Like, that is an, something that is a natural phenomenon and is, like, I that doesn't scare me. And I, you know, don't wish anything bad towards those people. It's the, like, kind of fictional, like, 
multi dimensions like stacking on each other that really fucking scares me and also like I'm really 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 scared of like organ theft and so the idea of somebody sewing my body so they could like steal my organs is like a big thing for me I literally like there's certain like there's a Batman villain called the doll maker I can't read anything that he's in I literally tapped out of Gotham a very stupid show because they had a like three like three episode arc of like organ stealing and I was like nope never again goodbye like it is a thing that I cannot handle. And I was like, oh, this is fun. I knew about the sharing space. I did not know about the organ theft. Yeah. I did not know that that was a thing for you. Would have warned you. Sorry about yeah, that. That's okay. <laughs> it's not a thing I like advertise because, you know, it's not in a lot of stuff. No. <laughs> Yeah, so it was a rough episode for me. The cannibalism was fine, but, like, I just didn't want to see where the organs came from. <laughs> <laughs> How on brand. <laughs> so fucking on brand. <laughs> I mean, it was gross, the, like, chunky, viscous fluid. Uh, I feel like they could have, they had to have been better ways to, like, prepare it, right? It's just in a blender. It's not even, like, a food processor. They're just, yeah. like, putting it in the blender. I feel like there's got to be better ways to eat that. I don't know. The first, the surgeon at the beginning too, like takes the pancreas out and like licks it. Like there has got to be a better way than this. There, there has got to be a better way. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, disgusting. It was a lot for me. Yeah, <laughs> I do think that. Okay, I'm gonna. I need to. I need to talk about this episode as like pretending that it's like two different episodes. Okay, because there's like the horror element and the like um, monster of the weeky type stuff, and then you know they're very emotional <laughs> bullshit. <Yeah. laughs> Um, so like the monster stuff, it's like, a, it's an interesting monster. I guess I don't know that much about cults. Cause I was like, so they made you pretty. Cause the idea is that all these people had like, were ugly or had a malformation that made them feel bad about themselves. So they like went to a cult to become beautiful, but then they were like, oh, you made me beautiful. I guess I'll just lie on this floor until you want to eat me. I guess. <laughs> Fucking other people in the cult, That's though. That's true. Other hot people. Yeah. Not enough smell acting in this episode. <laughs> it's like, Mulder and Scully should have walked in that house and been like, yep, some of the bad's here. Well, the- A, there's a giant blood stain there, but also it smells like human meat and blood and also just like 20... 20- 20 year olds fucking all the time. <laughs> just, you know, bad. You know, it smells yeah, crazy that's, in there. Everyone's very sweaty. It's not a good vibe. But the building super says that too. He's like, I go in there to fix things when they call me and they need me, and I never see anyone, but I fucking know they're there because it smells fucking crazy in there yeah. too. So it's already been like pointed out that it must smell horrific in there. I assume with Scully, she's like, I've done enough autopsies that I'm nose blind. And that's for like, I can wave that away for her. And with Mulder, I think he's just crazy. <laughs> just, I feel like he's got to be like, no, nope. no, uh, just once. Or just like a scene of them like taking out a little fixed vapor rub out of their pockets and just being like, <laughs> and then continuing. <laughs> If I had to redo the X Files, it's the one thing I would add in. Just uh, they always carry around their gun and their badges and a little tin of fix paper to just put under their nose. It does happen in the first season that there are a couple of times where Mulder's around an autopsy or around like a organ disposal bin and does do the smell acting and he like Ralphs basically yeah. and like gags about it and then it's just like I'm nose blind now I've done this so many times that like I'm not even affected by this anymore and I assume by the time they're in their 50s they're just like almost COVID <laughs> nose blind they <laughs> just can't their, smell anything their senses just don't work anymore <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, like, that was a lot. So I guess my whole thing, because well, I was talking to you, I was like, why are they these people saying, they're like, it's a cult, that's what cults do. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I guess. They, like, want to, like, that kid stabs himself, and they're, like, full, like. They eat him like, alive. They eat him alive. Yeah, sure do. While she sings a jaunty little tune. <laughs> yeah. Good, like, camera angles and stuff. That, that scene, that horrific scene is shot very beautifully. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That character is so bizarre and interesting. It's very and like, uh, Death Becomes Her. Yeah. And I like, too, that the last, because this is like the penultimate of the extended series, the last monster of the week is a human. Like, there, that's it. It's not like, oh, I, I did this thing and I became immortal through whatever means or like Flint. I was like, this I'm is just it. immortal. It's like, no, I'm doing these horrific things to keep myself alive. And I'm pretending that that this is fine. And like, 
it's fine to be attached ass backwards to these people. Yeah, I mean, in your summary, you said this, but you're right. Like, what is the price of this? And also, like, they stay at home all the time. And she has this, like, obsession with their beauty and stuff. But nobody, I guess those tweens are telling her that she's hot all the time. Like, what is the point? Yeah. It's and he's up. just like they're just like attached to people. Yeah. And also, doesn't that hurt? You would assume so. I'm assuming that they're pumped full of fucking drugs. I guess like in that thing he had, they they had a lot of IVs and stuff. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. It is. It's pretty horrific. I think it's one of the most horrific X Files episodes. Yeah. No, actually. it's not great. Yeah. It's. Uh, I, I think part of what makes it so horrific is that it's so human. That it's like. It, we'll do it's, anything for beauty and immortality. Yeah, and it's not like, oh, here's a monster that does this like horrific monster stuff or people get fucked up by this monster. It's just people fucking people up and people voluntarily fucking themselves up, which is, I mean, that's what makes cults so fucking scary. Yeah. That you, you, you ask, like, do these people have like brain damage? And the answer is yes, because they're in a cult and they've been brainwashed and they're now like... Because they're experiencing this, like, anti-aging process by eating other people's organs, like, they're actually watching themselves physically transform. And so it's like, she asks, like, didn't I make you beautiful? Didn't I change your lives for the better? And they're like, well, yeah, I guess. You gave me what I wanted. I'm hot and I get sex now. Right. And that's like, okay. I'm not allowed to shower. <laughs> not allowed to shower. I'm not allowed to be in the sun ever. Sunlight is verboten. We do not be. I love that she says, like, it's not too late for you. <laughs> you were like, Scully looks great for her age. Fuck off. Yeah. Like, Scully's in her mid-50s and looks amazing. So, like, I think it's fine, actually. Yeah, it's uh, it's really fucked up. I do love that scene where they're like, we're looking for Barbara Beaumont, an 85-year-old woman. She's like, don't you recognize me? I look so good for my age. And I look amazing. And they're like, that's horrifying. Like, you shouldn't look like this. And yeah. like, then she just starts to panic and freak out. Like, She doesn't talk to people anymore, so she doesn't know. She only talks to her weird cult worshipers. Yeah. And watches old videos of herself. And recites along with it. <sighs> I did like the 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 vengeance storyline. The girl that was, or what's her name, Juliet. Juliet, Juliet fucking ruled. And like, yeah, she was a murderer, but like those people probably should have been murdered a hundred percent. Those people all deserve to die. And they and were she murderers. did it in a super badass way. We love a theme. Definitely kill them with the church stakes. That's cool as hell. <laughs> I love that. That was awesome. And she was really good. And I love that she was just like, yeah, no, I'm gonna like read the Bible and I'm going to use it to enact some Old Testament vengeance and then I'm going to give myself up. That's chill. That was my plan. My plan worked fucking perfectly. I saved my sister. Deuces. (laughs) She ruled. (laughs) Big fan of Julia. (laughs) Big fan. Also, imagine going to prison. People are like, what are you in for? Oh, I murdered a cult to death with a bunch of church stakes through the heart. Yeah. What what did you do? Tax fraud? Cool. 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 It's like that scene in A Certain Hunger. <laughs> oh, I murdered and ate a bunch of people. Do you want to go? <laughs> and they're all no. like, actually, no. <laughs> I'm here for Grand Theft Auto. Please don't touch me. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it felt like a very CW moment of two of like, who's this arrow motherfucker? Yeah. Her like hoodie and her backpack and stuff. And I was like, I'm into this Vengeance is the Night thing. Like, I like it. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so that's that storyline, right? And then this, like, you know, we've said it. That's its penultimate episode. It's, like, the second to last episode. We have, like, ten and a half seasons of them, like, having feelings. And then, like, they got together, but they didn't get together. And then apparently had they a kid, which you guys call Totally Normal William, <laughs> which really, really <laughs> speaks highly of him. <laughs> <laughs> like they've died, they've other people have died, they've come back, they've disappeared, whatever. Who knows? They've been abducted. Who who knows what's happened? They've definitely had a threesome with Skinner at this point. <laughs> like they've had a wild ride. Okay, like there's a lot to unpack here, and I like that their scenes they vacillate between we're an old married couple making fun of each other. And that's, like, our vibe. And, like, that's been their vibe since the beginning. But now it's instead of, like, oh, we're playfully flirting. It's, like, we're an established old married couple. You didn't recognize my haircut for how many days? Like, fuck you. (laughs) Oh, yeah, your glasses? Yeah, you're definitely going blind. Like, that's, like, cute bickering banter. They're still very good partners or whatever. And then these, like, that final scene of him being, like, I don't need God because I believe in you. And, like, 
that's it. That's the whole thing. Like, I don't I don't need to believe. I believe in you. That's mm-hmm. we wrapped it up. Aliens. Pff, I got you. <laughs> this is fine. And I love, too, that he's like, you know, I, I, I wish for your sake that you had left because then your sister would be alive and you could have married a normal person and you could have had the children that you wanted. And like, yeah. I kept you from this life. And it's him like really acknowledging that. Just that like idea that Kirk said in the last um, episode where he was like, well, sometimes love is about sacrifice. And like for Mulder to be like, I I would sacrifice that. I would give you up t- so you would have a better life. Right. And then for her Feels to like be a like, very mature moment for him. Yeah. And then for her to be like, but I don't want any of that. I want and and for her too to be like i thought we could have a child and i failed and i thought and we I could fled. and i thought we could live together and i fled like is also like a big moment for scully too to admit this like i thought i was one way but i'm not actually and i'm like you yeah <laughs> this, this like <laughs> i i pray to my own god to help me figure this out and like i'm still who i am and like she has this line that's something like, when you can't do things yourself, you ask for God's hand to do things for you. And it's like, okay, well, you've clearly been praying for some kind of answer to this. And yet here you are still with this person by choice, but also by like fate or destiny or whatever. And like that moment where he rescues her from the elevator shaft and all the garbage, like is also very sweet. <laughs> He's like, oh, you stink. And she's just like, thanks, Mulder. And they're just like, uh, I'm in love with you. And it's like, also there's some like fucked up shit happening over here. Here, they're maybe. like totally not like they're like we figured it out it'll clean itself up right and Juliet's like I understand what I did and you said too like you couldn't have run into a better pair of no agents. Bobby said that no, except okay. for apparently she does go to jail but that that even you know what headcanon I'm headcanoning this Mulder and Scully both were like we can hand wavy this like if you want like those people deserve to die we're old we don't want to deal with paperwork you seem unbalanced but like you seem like you'll stop this cult's dead and she was like no this is like my punishment I'm very religious like I have to (laughs) that's part of the plan I have to do this and they were like okay I guess we'll file this fucking paperwork I think she's just doing a couple months for defacement of public property for the damage to the church fence and that's it and they're like oh I like that I like I like I think they work together I think that she's like no I have to go to jail and they're like okay We'll, we'll let you go to jail, but we're going to sweep all of this under the rug. Right. <laughs> and then she's like, all right. Okay, fine. Her mom could still be sad about that. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot going on in this episode. Yeah. I also really like in the final scene, it feels like there's going to be a kiss. And then she like leans in and whispers to him and there's not a kiss. And I actually really like that there's not a kiss. Because like. Obviously, they have kissed and will kiss after this, probably, in the, the, you know, fictional world that, like, exists after this ends. But, like, that scene... <laughs> I don't even want to talk okay. about the actual finale. You really need to watch no, the whole series first. No, I just meant, first. like, I don't know, in the world of fan no, fiction. You're, 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 no, you're totally right. It's just... I, I literally don't even want I cannot spoil the last part of the of the last episode. You really do have to get all the way there so that you can experience it for yourself. Okay, great. But I'm just saying that scene I felt was more powerful without like a traditional showing of love because they aren't traditional at all. Right. Yes. And like her sharing a secret with him feels more personal and like their brand. Yeah. Than just like a normal kiss. Yeah. What do you think she tells him? I have no idea. I don't want to know. I feel like, I mean, they've been talking about, like, Mulder's like, I can't tell you what I'm praying for because then it it's won't come. It's a birthday candle. Yeah, and I think that that's what she's telling him is what I'm praying for is some kind of resolution about us and, and what we come to. Because he says, too, like, I wondered how this would end. Yeah. And so I assume she's telling him, like, I, I'm i praying for us to work or I'm praying for our relationship to. I'm praying that I have the strength to not flee. Yeah, and, like. I I just love that scene. Like it's I I don't rewatch these episodes before we watch them together because I've watched all of these so many fucking times that I also prefer to like rewatch them with you so I get that same experience of like, oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about this like oh my god thing. And we got to this last scene and I was like, I had erased this from my memory. I forgot this was this episode. It's like, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. <laughs> but I love that scene. I just think it's such a beautiful way for them to like I wish this was the last episode in lots of ways. There's like shit that they have to do in the actual last episode that I think is 
is important for their characters, even if I find it very frustrating because I find the mythology super frustrating. But like, that's such a good wrap up of their characters. It's such a good moment between the two of them where like, I like, like you said, it's, I don't need faith because I have you. And like, that's so important to both of them and to have both of them recognize like, I love you so deeply. I would give up everything for you. I have. And and for the other person to be like, I don't want that. I don't begrudge you that all of this shit happened. That I would rather that have happened so that we could be here in this place together. I just think it's really beautiful. Yeah. (sighs) It's a fun fact. Sure. (laughs) Tag on for this episode is I want to be beautiful, which you saw. They like actually throw it up at the beginning. I love when that happens. I love when they like throw things up during that. Of course I'm a nerd. (laughs) Duh. (laughs) This episode was written by Karen Nielsen. This is her first writing credit for the entire series. She also served as the script supervisor for seasons 10 and 11. So like she's obviously very familiar with the show. She talked about how she was inspired by the fact that her sister is very Catholic and she is not just like Mulder and Scully. And she and James Wong workshopped this idea uh, into this juxtaposition of faith in a church and faith in a cult. And like, yeah. Oh, I didn't think about that. Like, totally. Like, really, what's the difference? Right. And like, one is socially acceptable and one is fucked up. But when like, you eat a cracker that symbolizes the body of Christ, one you but eat. But if you're Catholic, the through trans body commutation, like. It is the body of Christ. Like, you are actually doing a cannibalism. That is what happens in Catholicism. Right, right, right. But, like, I know that's, like, hand-wavy. Like, that's what's happening. But also, it is a cracker, and they ate that kid alive. (laughs) Right, exactly. Yes. (laughs) But, again, it's that same idea of, like, if you believe in the literal world of the word of the Bible, you are eating the body. I love that scene where she went up to the priest and was, like, and quoted the Bible back to him. And he was like, oh, oh, no. I mean, yes, it's in the Bible. But maybe we could, you want to read this? passage yeah. about like love other, please don't write the Old Testament anymore. <laughs> and she was like no 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 I don't need you goodbye. Goodbye <laughs> What I need are these steaks <laughs> Nielsen also said she felt that she wanted the final scene of the episode to relate to the upcoming conclusion and she wanted something that would lead up to totally normal William while trying to build up some of some of the momentum that she felt was needed towards the end because like we when we watched Sunshine Days people complained like you didn't do a good enough job of wrapping up nine seasons of this fucking show and so like she put the even though I think Bobby will talk about this. This wasn't originally supposed to be the last episode. She clearly understood. Like, yeah. it's really important that we just like toss this stuff in there. Like, we really need this at the end. Yeah. So I appreciate that this is in there. But also, like, honestly, if you're 11 seasons and a couple of decades into the X Files, if you don't anticipate that this is like not gonna wrap up cleanly, like, maybe that's on you, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to like wrap up. A monolith. Yeah. Right? Like, back in the 60s, like, Star Trek just fucking ends. Like, they didn't have to wrap up shit. But, like, I mean, as a Supernatural fan, right? Like, this, the season finale, or series finale is, like, a big fucking, like, everyone, fu- not everyone, but most people, like, hate it. And there's, like, a lot of, like, feelings about it. And, like, I haven't watched it, but I know what happens. And, like, I... I understand the fandom reaction, and I'm sure I'll have a similar reaction, but I also understand, like, how do you wrap up 15 seasons? How do you wrap up 11 seasons, but also specifically with the X-Files, the breadth, like, the length of it, right? Like, decades. Decades. Yeah, absolutely. How do you wrap it up? You kind of can. No, you can't, really. Part of the reason why transformative, like, fiction is important and important because yeah. it's like you don't you don't have to like right you guys did your best and you failed you always fail no no the nature is that you will no fail. series finale is really gonna nail it like there are there have been some like i understand but like overall most series finales suck yeah because it's hard to wrap up all of these storylines yep. and and not necessarily even the like moving pieces but also like the emotional attachment and investment into the the characters and stuff like even if you somehow even if the writers of something could somehow like totally fix the mythology and really slot everything where it needed to go or whatever i feel like people would still be unsa- like unsatisfied yes. like it's just the nature of the beast absolutely i totally agree with that as you mentioned earlier, Scully gets her haircut and Mulder doesn't notice. Like, we'll watch that episode actually coming up at the beginning of season three of Extracts. But that's like, she goes from having this like super long hair, which we've seen a couple of times, to this short bob. Literally doesn't notice. <laughs> like, and I like that. I feel like that's such a married couple yeah. thing. And like, a couple of years ago, I cut my hair really, really short. And like, my husband obviously noticed immediately because he hates it when I have my hair short. 
We had gone to a Thanksgiving dinner with his family the night before I got it cut. And then like two nights later, I went out with his mom and his brother and we went and saw a show and neither of them noticed. Straight up didn't notice. And we got to the end of the night and Michael was like, did you guys really not notice that my wife cut like a foot and a half off of her hair? Like, can you really not see this? And so I love that scene where it's like, yeah, that does happen. Yeah. <laughs> and people will just like straight up not see stuff that they don't want to see. So I love that. I also love that we get the return of Mulder's glasses. He wears them very occasionally in the first season and sometimes in season two. But like we haven't seen him wear glasses basically since then. Obviously, he's wearing both bifocals. They're Just progressives. Sh- <laughs> They're bifocals. <laughs> That's just language that old people use to make themselves feel better. This is funny. But they've done this to show the passage of time. And also, just like a weird fun fact about those those glasses that he's wearing are Jillian Anderson's actual glasses. Right. <laughs> so I love the idea that like the prop people were like, you know what would look great on Mulder? Jillian Anderson's actual glasses. So he made a bunch of jokes about like, oh, wasn't that blonde woman in the church wearing these same glasses earlier? (laughs) So I like that idea too, that it's like drawing their characters in from their real life. Because again, it's been going on for so fucking long that like, I like those little pieces of that. Barbara Beaumont's name is a combination of Barbara Billingsley and Hugh Beaumont, who played June and Ward Cleaver on Leave it to Beaver, which like, that makes sense that that's who this character is. (laughs) I also love the fake backstory that they make up. I also love that Mulder like does a deep throat's mission, looks in the super's office, and is like she was in this and this and also this <laughs> other thing, and then here's what happened to her afterwards. So it's like that's very lovely. I like that a lot. And then she just disappeared. Then she just disappeared. Some critics said the title of the episode was a little on the nose. Nothing lasts forever. Obviously, we're at, like the end of the series. What do they want to call it? Cannibal like cult fest? <laughs> like. Right. The original episode title was Unremarkable, and the... It's not a good title. Yeah, it's not a great... Nothing Lasts Forever is a better episode title for this. But something that I learned that I did not know, that, like, this is part of the reason I like doing these deep dives on these episodes for this show, Unremarkable was the name of the episode. It's also the name that fans used for Mulder and Scully's shared home was the Unremarkable home. And so that, like ties this episode together of the two of them like talking that they live together and I didn't realize too that house that we've seen Mulder in was their house like the two of them live there together and then as she says I fled away from this and then she buys this like dope ass house which you'll see in a coming episode in season three it's insane (laughs) it looks like John Wick's house it's super fucking nice (laughs) she's like I can't live in this unremarkable piece of shit anymore I'm gonna go live in this super high tech glass castle basically but I didn't know that the FBI pays super well these days yeah she's like I've been working here forever I make a ton of money also I was a doctor for like four years because Mulder was wanted by the FBI we'll get to it it's like a whole fucking thing (laughs) but I I like that like again doing these like deep dives on this episode I feel like I'm still learning stuff about this monolith that I care a lot about too so I found that very interesting synopsis showdown sure all right a truly horrifying cult worships beauty by eating human organs attaching themselves together and generally causing havoc oh also Mulder and Scully are in love sobbing noises what's scarier talking about your feelings for your soulmate or chasing down a disgusting beauty cannibal cult that's a weird disgusting a beauty cannibal cult cannibal beauty cult (laughs) You know what? I struggle with that one. <laughs> Leave it in. <laughs> Look, these two episodes were a lot for me to handle <laughs> in very different ways. So, like, I think my broken brain can be excused. Yeah, that's fine. That's okay. <laughs> Are you ready for Deep for Throat's mission long? I am, yes. Okay. Three old and lonely man. Starting with Star Trek, this is written by Jerome Bixby, the guy who wrote Mirror Mirror by any other name and Day of the Dove. This man can write good Trek episodes. And said we got this. But also, (laughs) I can't. You heard my thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I feel like it shows that he does have like kind of a deep and nuanced understanding of the characters. Yes. Like. He wrote Mirror Mirror. Yeah. Oh. Okay, this episode is directed by Murray Golden. This is Murray's only Trek episode, but he's known for his work on Wanted, Dead or Alive, Death Valley Days, Bonanza, Burke's Law, Batman, The Flying Nun, Mannix, and Medical Center. This first aired on February 14th, 1969. That's right, Valentine's (laughs) Day. (laughs) I can't with this episode! (laughs) No! 
I've just been keeping that ace in my back pocket this whole show. Oh my god! <laughs> Those poor women who yes. watched this for the first and time on Valentine's Day drives me insane. <gasps> oh my god! I'm gonna have a psychotic break. <laughs> well, I think we found the sound clip for this episode. Oh my god! <laughs> Aaron, I think you mentioned a couple of times, like how varied the shots are. There, there's those weird overhead shots that had ADR. There's some of them where you're like, oh, this doesn't look good at yeah. all. <laughs> Cinematographer Al Francis was absent for the first three days of production due to illness. He was replaced by John Finger, who was working at Desi Liu on Gomer Pyle at the time for the first two days. And then a cameraman, Ernest Holler, who also shot Where No Man Has Gone Before for the third. So if this episode looks pieced together vision-wise, it's because it is. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because there were some really varied changes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It seems so incongruous. Stell mentioned other people that Flint was supposed to be. One of those other other people is instead uh, he was supposed to have been Beethoven as well because the writer thought that Beethoven had kind of like a Neanderthal cast to his face. And so Beethoven is also this weird timeless being as well. But they didn't pretended to be blind or deaf. Not blind. (laughs) Deaf. I mean, yeah, sure. Like, that's a great way for to get people to stop fucking talking to you, yeah, right? Yeah, he it's hates true. people. He bought a whole planet. <laughs> right. That's true. Fair enough. The Brahms paraphrase Spock plays was written especially for this episode by Ivan Dittmers. The sheet music shown is of Brahms. His 16 waltzes up 39. Dittmers also performs the classical music that we hear in the Squire of Gothos as well. Weirdly similar sets and vibes. Uh huh. Which and there's that line where Spock is or Spock and Kirk are talking. They're like, "Is this an illusion? Like, this all seems so weird." And and like he seems weird. And like in my head, I was like, "They're like, is this a Squire of Gothos vibe? Is this a Q vibe? Are we being cued? <laughs> are we being cued currently?" Y'all mentioned kind of like the mishmash background stuff of all of the sets on this. It looks like a museum, and so of course it's this pastiche of history and culture, and also older Trek episodes. Spock sits in an ornate chair, and that chair we've seen is used by fellow Strange emotion havers and also tiny ship lovers, Korob and Sylvia from Cat's Paw. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah there's the, also like similar vibes from that. Oh, in definitely. Episode two. In the outer room of Flint's laboratory, just in front of the vertical grill, is the female Romulan commander's communication box from the Enterprise incident. There's also some um, wall ornaments from the Cloud Minders, but we have not watched that yet. So we'll talk about it later. That's a weird episode. Yeah. It's a floating robot. So, of course, the bottom of the M4 robot is the upper carriage of the Nomad from the Changeling. Also, it's called the M4 robot, and we've already encountered the M5 robots, dude. Just name them something else. Be creative. Hire a marketing guy. (laughs) Stell mentioned that there are some extended universe stuff featuring these characters. One of the stories that features... Flint and Reyna most prominently is in a short stories compilation called Strange New Worlds. The story itself is called The Immortality Blues. <laughs> and it's about Flint on Earth in New York during World War III, which I think is kind of interesting. It would be interesting to see a perspective of him, someone in time, viewing a world going through another world war and then assumingly leaves soon after that. I would have to imagine timeline wise. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's smart to use him in, in other stuff, especially like historical shit. Like it's smart to use him. It's just also like, fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. (laughs) So we're just going to go ahead and jump to casting stuff to burn (laughs) through this. Just the two of them, right? Actually, it's me, so I'm going to talk about the stunt doubles as well, because we saw a fight in this. That's David Sharp as James Daly, who plays Flint. That's his stunt double. He also plays a crewman in Day of the Dove. Sharp had performed stunts in 4,500 films, beginning in 1992's Robin Hood and concluding with 1978's Heaven Can Wait. Oh, whoa, whoa, wow. Sharp was a founding member of the Stuntman's Association and an inductee into the Stuntman's Hall of Fame and recipient of the Yakima Canute Award. He was badass, yeah. so I just wanted to talk to him. That's Paul Baxley as Shatner's stunt double. We've talked about his work in the past. He's one of Shatner's regular doubles. We will then talk about Louis Sorrell, who plays Reyna. 
She would go on to work with Shatner on an episode of Shatner's series Barbary Coast and the 1976 TV movie Perilous Voyage and also the 1982 film Airplane 2, the sequel. So her and Shatner just worked together a Do bunch. Do you want to mash our faces together again? <laughs> Great. <laughs> I mean, I kissed you for this. So like, I guess, yeah, it's okay. We're good. She's very pretty. She looks like fucking Lady Gaga. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. However, she was best known for playing conniving characters on American daytime soap operas, most notably Santa Barbara as Augusta Lockridge, Days of Our Lives as Vivian Alamein, and she did that from 1992 to 2000 and then reprised the role again in 09 to 2011. Damn. She won a number of Soap Opera Digest awards for that role. She's just a huge soap star. Other soaps she's worked on include One Life to Live and Port Charles. Up until 2020, she was on both Port Charles and Beacon Hill. So she was working soap operas up until 2020, up until super recently. Wow. Wow. Yeah. She she alive? There is no death date listed okay. on IMDb. However, her last credits are 2020. Okay. So yeah. maybe she was just like, I'm very old. And also pandemic. Also, yeah. I'll leave this in on the show. I've stopped saying when people die because I've realized it's fucking sad. Yeah. And a lot of these lists ended up ending on like, right. and if, then they die. Right. <laughs> what if she like, you know, if they die very recently and they have that like yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. There was no end date listed on her IMDb. So if she has, it has not been updated anything like that. Searle also made guest appearances on such shows as The Fugitive, Bonanza, I Spy, Medical Center, Hawaii Five-0, Charlie's Angels, Different Strokes, and Law and & Order. She was a regular on The Don Rickles Show in 72 and Ladies Man from 1980 to 81. Had a recurring role in Knott's Landing. Her film credits include Plaza Suite and The Mark of Zorro. She comes from a theater background, studying at the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York, made her Broadway debut playing a teenager in the 1961 comedy Take Her, She's Mine, starring Art Carney, and also had subsequent roles in 63's Lorenzo and Man and Boy. She went on to co-star on Broadway with Rita Moreno in The Sign in Sidney Brestine's Window in 64 and appeared with George C. Scott and Colleen Dewhurst as Princess Alias in the 67 Buck County Playhouse production of The Lion in Winter. Outside acting, she's been involved with the Friends of Sea Lions and the Celebrity Action Council. Uh, the Friends of Sea Lions happened during that El Nino winter season, and apparently a bunch of people banded together to save the sea lions that were offset and hurt by El Nino. That's great. The Celebrity Action Council isn't a charity truly, but it works to help rehabilitate women who have been either abused or had drug problems in and around Hollywood. Necessary. Mm-hmm. She had studied French at the Institut de la France in Vie Francais Semer. That is fake French by me. <laughs> I think I pulled it off, though. Yeah, that was pretty good. So yeah, gonna... I was like, oh, Bobby. <laughs> Hello. She had her Days of Our Lives dressing room painted with a mural depicting Paris in summertime. So she cute. just loved France. It's really cute. In 1964, she married comic actor Herb Edelman, best known for his recurring role as B. Arthur's ex-husband Stan in The Golden Girls. Oh my Girls. god, Stan! But they divorced in the 70s. I mean, that's not surprising. It's the 70s. I Stan! Put that, I put that note in just to pop you, and yeah, it worked. it worked. <laughs> He's great on The Golden Girls. Yeah, he is. So that'll bring us to James Daly, who was Flint. Daly was born in Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin in 1918. And he is father of actors Tim Daly of Wings fame and Tyne Daly of Cagney and Lacey fame. Oh, oh, shit. By the time he appeared in his third Broadway play, Man and Superman, he was billed third in the cast and won a Daniel Bloom Award for his performance. Subsequently, Daly had a busy time on stage, both on and off Broadway. He co-starred... Three times with Helen Hayes, most famously in The Glass Menagerie in 1950. God, they've been performing that play for forever. Mm -hmm. The same year, he also collected the Theater Guild Awards as the star of Major Barbara. His other theatrical roles included Billy Budd, St. Joan, The Merchant of Venice, and on tour with aforementioned Colleen Dewhurst, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. He jumps to TV as a regular cast member on Foreign Intrigue before going on to be the star of Give Us Barabbas in 61. Four years later, he picked up an Emmy for his role in the Hallmark Hall of Fame episode, The Eagle and the Cage. Other memorable roles of his, an episode of The Twilight Zone in 59 called The Stop at Willoughby, where Daly plays a salesperson driven to the brink of a nervous breakdown, desperately escaping 
his world to a fantasy town in his own mind where his life is perpetually simple and peaceful. We see a theme presenting itself. <laughs> Other notable roles include Honoris in the original Plan of the Apes and Dr. Paul Lochner on 171 episodes of Medical Center. That's a lot of episodes. <laughs> Just like pre-ERER. I, I think so, yeah. It's come up a few times and like yeah. everyone who's on it was on it for a while. I think it's another soap thing. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on, the Sex Wiles episode was directed by James Wong, and as Aaron stated earlier, it was written by Karen Nielsen. Karen Nielsen, aside from this and her work on X-Files, is known for directing short films like Perceptions, Grace, and A Pickle, which stars William B. Davis. She also has credits in several production roles, including script and continuity department credits on Schmigadoon, Maid, Antlers, and the upcoming TV adaptation of The Last of Us, which has a great cast and I think might actually be a really good video game to TV adaptation. I hope that is one, because that's one that I was like, man, I wish I could watch somebody play this. <laughs> there are full playthroughs yeah, but of I, I meant like hang out. I'm not just going right. to. There are a lot of things I will do. That's insane. But I'm not going to sit and watch somebody play a video game on the Internet. It is mold zombies. You know that, right? Yeah, I know. But it still seems cool. OK, so watch the TV show. I tried to play some scary video games because I thought that the stories were sounded cool, but they just scared me too much. Since this, oh, you keep going. Too sorry, immersive. no, I was just loving it. My own idiocy. Since this episode aired very recently, we can do a couple cool things, like pull an interview with her from X Files News, where she talks extensively about working on the show. I'll pull a few quotes from that right now. When asked about the whisper scene, she joked, you guys keep asking us for private moments to be on camera. So we gave you one on camera. We just didn't give it all to you. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. <laughs> and it, it, when talking about working on an episode so late in the season and late in the show, the pressure was incredibly overwhelming. Not only is it X-Files and not only my first time writing for network television, but it's also because of the whole backlash and stuff. People are watching, oh, this is why women don't write sci-fi is what you're terrified of hearing. I really hate the term strong female characters because I think that's very condescending because we're all strong women. I mean, three-dimensional women. And I feel like we did that. I'm really proud of that. Nobody is black and white. They're complicated female characters. My big strive was that we show this female perspective and that we show women can be complicated and fascinating and do fucked up shit. We're not just these feminine little creatures. Yeah, there are a lot of different kinds of women in this episode, yeah. mm -hmm. which is cool. Yeah. So as Aaron mentioned, this was not supposed to be the penultimate episode of the X-Files. It was switched with the episode before it. Episode eight in season 11 is familiar. That's right. Fucking Mr. Chuckle Teeth. <gasps> oh, that was the episode. Nope, we can't talk about it more because we will get to it in x Trek season four. Right. But it was the one that I originally picked for Spooky 30s. Oh, which oh, that would have been a weird penultimate episode. <laughs> so I think. But then you also picked the Twilight. We went through a lot of things. Yeah. So I think everybody nailed it in switching out with this. It's a great ramp up to the emotional yeah. connection of the final episode. I think that worked better for everyone because familiar would be like if this was episode eight and familiar was nine, it would just veer off course and then yeah. have to course. Correct. Yeah, that would be a that what a weird. Is the character's offload. name actually Chuckle Teeth. Yes. There is a character in the show called Mr. Chuckle Teeth. Horrifying. Not Just great. Wait. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it will be worse than this for me. Probably not. Yeah, honestly. this is a lot of triggers for me. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to get worse than Dreamland. <laughs> Fuck me up. In this episode, Mulder reveals he is a fan of Hammer horror films. Of course, that's dope because. <laughs> Horror, sweaty horror movie nerds and me love Hammer horror films. They're one of the forefathers of schlocky. That's where Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing got a lot of their earliest roles. Aside from Christopher Lee's Dracula, which is, of course, one of their most famous works, other choice Hammer films are The Vampire Lovers, The Reptile, The Curse of Frankenstein, Vampire Circus, The Devil Rides Out, 2010's Let Me In, Twins of Evil, and Captain Kronos, Vampire Hunter. All of these are superb late night baked watches. Just bring your expectations to the floor and just have a good time. Vampire Circus sounds fun. Hell yeah. <laughs> also, because this is so recent, I can do fun things like bring up a recap and comment thread on the X-Files subreddit yeah, and look at someone asking the question in Nothing Lasts Forever, a discussion, I want to know what's your theory, what did Scully whisper? Mm -hmm. 
the first but not most popular response you see on this thread is I think she wants them to leave the bureau to focus on finding and protecting William, which makes a lot of sense with what happens later. Sure. Yeah. There are other people who comment, we deserve better writing. Why would this series come back? Guys, Just I don't really like X Files fans. <laughs> They're dicks. <laughs> Everything you say, I'm like, I feel like you guys are, are missing the point. I feel like you're watching I appreciate a different X-Files show. fans for their like important and like fandom, but they seem like dicks and I don't want to participate. <laughs> the files, files got really bitter about the last yeah. seasons yeah. and how they were they vacillate between like parody of the X Files and then just hyper hyper main storyline stuff, yeah. main mythology stuff. So it was hard. I feel like lots of fandoms do break into two yes. like things where it's like we're so invested in like the story and like if things don't like if the plot holes aren't filled and blah 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 and then there are people who are like I'm invested in these characters and I can forgive a lot. Mm -hmm. And like obviously sometimes like they intersect and stuff and it's not just because you like one more than the other but like I feel like character driven fans are a little more forgiving. Yes. Other choice comments in this thread are probably the same thing Bill Murray whispered at the end of Lost in Translation. A sweeter answer is I think she whispered something along the lines of, I just don't want to give up. Your flies undone. <laughs> <laughs> and then most people just agreeing that it's probably something having to do with William, something having to do with being with Mulder again. Yeah. And then Mulder lights the candle. It's really sweet. It's really sweet. <laughs> Okay, I am going to try to frost this very odd tasting cake while going through this cast listing because 85% of this cast listing are people who have done guest roles on Supernatural as well. So we're going to go through it kind of fast, but Stell remembered a few of these people by sight just yeah. watching the well, episode. Juliet's French fry girl. <laughs> all right. All right. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> First as Calvin, that's Nick Heffelfinger. He was also Mace on iZombie. That is Guy Fauchin or Guy Fauchon <laughs> as Dr. David Rednon. He did two Millennium episodes, interestingly, in 97 and 98, and then comes back to do this in 2018. He also does guest work on Andromeda, SG-1, Psych. He is in the 2014 Supernatural episode, Girls, Girls, Girls. He plays Marty. Okay. I don't really remember his character, but that's a good episode because it's a Rowena episode where she, that's kind of like early Rowena where we're still figuring her out. I don't think it's her first episode, but Rowena fucks. Her commitment to evening gowns is admirable. She's a bad bitch. He also plays a Hare Krishna in Final Destination and recently a butler on Batwoman. That was a funny one, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's Garrett as a technician. His Supernatural episode was 2014's Do You Believe in Miracles? And he plays minion number one. Do you believe in miracles? Mm, I pulled up some of them because I wanted to. Because you read ahead? Yeah. Because yeah, I was like, I need to be ready for this. This is our X-Files Supernatural crossover <laughs> podcast. I think this episode just hits it harder than most, even most later season episodes. This is a weird confluence yeah. of this. Well, like everybody who was no longer working oh. on the X-Files, like all went to work on Supernatural. <laughs> I'm a dumbass. Do you believe in miracles is... The what the last episode of season nine and Dean dies with the mark of Cain and then wakes up as a demon. It's the the beginning of Demon Dean. Beginning of Demon Dean. Yeah, of course. It is the it is one of the best series like cliffhangers ever. Like the last scene that everyone thinks Dean is dead and then he wakes up with black eyes. That was fucking good. That is good. Garrett also guests as Skell on Arrow and Bill Dickerson on Riverdale. Jay Hindle as the only seen on TV sitcom Joe, her husband, that they're doing back and forth in separate beds, of course. He's guested on Smallville, The 100, Max Allister on Project MC Squared, Supergirl, and two different episodes <laughs> okay. of Supernatural. One you haven't seen yet because it's 2019's okay. Atomic and Monsters. I'm in season 13. And the other is The Werther Project where he plays man. He's just a man. Oh, that's also a good Rowena episode, but it's also like... They have to spill their blood to open a safe. It's pretty good. Sure. <laughs> that is Albert Nichols as Agent Bill Bloodworth. His two supernatural <laughs> episodes are his run as Jonah in The Form in the Void and Out of Darkness into the Fire, which yeah. we talked about. He's an angel character. Yeah, that's when 
Cass is going mad and the darkness has been released and blah, blah, blah. Doesn't end well for Jonah. <laughs> and funny enough, playing opposite him is Aiden Khan as Agent Colquitt, who his Supernatural episode is 2016's wrestling theme to be on the mat where he plays Duke and he plays a demon. A demon. Yeah. So he's like a crossroads demon there. And that is the episode with the Miz. <laughs> It's also, if you're a wrestling fan, like, it's fun to see The Miz, but it is, like, a pretty depressing spot-on representation of, like, aging wrestlers in indie wrestling. And also there's a very embarrassing scene where Dean runs the ropes. <laughs> so, And also The Miz is there. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. How far does this supernatural thread go into this episode? Cameron McDonald, who plays the priest in one fucking scene, is also Jim Miller on the 2006 episode Nightmare. Oh, they literally go inside a nightmare. <laughs> Aptly named. Yeah. As Kayla, that's Genevieve Boucher. No, as Ke- I was being too fa- friends. I was being Boucher. too French. As Kayla, that's Genevieve Buckner. <laughs> <laughs> that's some keeping up appearances bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boucher residence, lady of the house speaking. <laughs> But she has been involved with acting since she was a young age because she was Isabel Bannister in the Robin Williams sci-fi thriller Final Cut. She's Heidi Moore on the 4400. Oh, I was wrong. Sorry. It's not Nightmare. There is an episode where they go into Nightmares. I don't remember what it is. Nightmare is the one with the actress who plays Aunt Zelda in Sabrina the Teenage Witch and a kid with like telekinesis who's trying to kill his like abusive parents with a knife. And uh, Sam and Doom dress up, I think, as priests for the first time. (laughs) So, but mark it on your king bingo. (laughs) Sorry. It's all right. She plays Fox on The 100, Madison on Unreal. She's also Tamara Adama on Caprica. I don't think you ended up watching Caprica, did you? No, I didn't. Yeah, okay. It's a mixed bag and it's all very confusing. It's a mixed bag. And, (laughs) sigh, her episodes of Supernatural. (laughs) Jesus Christ. She's Lily Shoemaker in 2005's Bloody Mary. Yeah, that is an episode about Bloody Mary. It's actually one of the strong... It's season one. It's one of the stronger, scarier episodes. It's, like, pretty fucked up. And then she plays a character named Samantha in 2018's Mint Condition, which... Which I haven't gotten ...have not seen yet. That is Fabiola Colmenero as Josephine Bacanegra. She played a nurse in Deadpool and was also on Providence Psych and iZombie. Nice. Samuel Patrick Chu as our sweet, sweet stab himself boy, Warren. (laughs) He was in an episode of Eureka, an episode of Battlestar Galactica. He was Milo in the episode Dirty Hands. Dirty Hands is the one where the fuel chief kind of holds the whole fleet hostage by giving everyone bad fuel. Does that ring a bell? Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 I remember that. He was Chet on Alcatraz, Filbert on Level Up, Brandon on Spooksville, Andy Wang on Imposters, Curtis on iZombie, and no one on Supernatural. Oh. So I love him very much, and I hold his soul Whatever. dear in my heart. You're having fun. I know. As Olivia Bocanegra, the one who gets sewn up, and yeah, that is Michaela Aguilera. She has a movie she's in and has a producer credit on called Re, colon, Uniting, starring Jesse J. Martin, Michelle Harrison, and Roger Cross. That's about to come out. So I think she's, like, about to do more. Oh, okay. But she's one of those people, since this is so recent, that, like, hasn't really touched much else yet. As Price, the super, that is Viv Leacock. He voices Wiggins on Sherlock Holmes in the 22nd century. Coleman on Project Arms. He's also plays Kinsey Park in Freddy vs. Jason. Five episodes of Psych as various characters. Smallville, voices on Wreck-It Rabbit. Episodes of Eureka, Continuum. Grips on Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. He voices Doug Jonesy Jones on Netflix's Kong, King of the Apes, which is apparently a King Kong kids show. Sounds cool. (laughs) He's Steve on Loudermilk and most recently was Reese on the new Lost in Space series. And he's also in three episodes of Supernatural. He is Pete Hensley in 2009's Death Takes a Holiday. I think that's the first time we meet. No, that's not true. For Death Takes a Holiday... It's a town where people stop dying. And in 24... 24- oh, 
rip, I guess. <laughs> and in 2014, he's in two episodes as a character named Gerald. The Things We Left Behind and Girls, Girls, Girls. Things We Left... We talked about Girls, Girls, Girls. Yeah. Things We Left Behind is a really intense emotional episode because it's a Claire episode where she's like, you're not my dad. You're just like a weird angel in my dad's body. Stop trying to care about me. <laughs> as the absolute... Yeah. Badass Juliet Bocanegra, that is Carlena Bridge. She was a dancer on 37 episodes of Lip Sync Battle. She fucking rules. Damn. Also, she's so pretty. Totally moves like a dancer in the episode, too. Like, all of that makes sense. She then goes on to play Greta on Charmed and recently was Paula Carbone on Another Life. And she also has one Supernatural episode. What is that character's name? Because I just call her French Fry Girl. She is Miriam in Lost and Found. That's yeah. her character's name. She is fucking good in that episode. They're like looking for Jack. It's like an early season three episode and he's wandering around naked. And she is super rip roaring drunk at like a burger place at like 9 a.m. And is like, I want fries. And he's like, we have hash browns right now. They're basically fries. And she's like, they're fucking not. They're not. <laughs> they're not. And he's like, can you just eat the hash browns? And then she like weirdly corners Dean and like reads him to filth kind of dr- <laughs> drunk and then shows up later possessed by an angel. And then she dies, which sucks. Like rip French fry girl. But she was very good. She's a, a throwaway character. And is very good in that episode. I prefaced before Stell watched this episode. I tried to give her a trigger warning about the body stuff and didn't know about her organ transplant thing. <laughs> but I also said there's like a bunch of people in Supernatural in this. And as soon as she is shown like from that <laughs> down up shot, Stell's like, oh, yeah, it's French Fry Girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would even if you had not given me the Supernatural warning, like I just watched that episode and she like imprinted on my soul. I love French Fry Girl. <laughs> That is as Dr. Randolph Levenis, Jer Burns, who I always call Birdface Guy because I've seen him on TV since I was a young kid, and he looks like that angry eagle Muppet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sam the Eagle. Sam, yeah. yeah, Sam the Eagle. <laughs> um, yeah, he's done... God, he's had such an amazing career. Uh, main cast roles include Brughel on Max Headroom, Kirk Morris on Dear John, Jake Farrell on Something So Right, Frank on Good Morning Miami, two episodes of Boston Legal. He was group leader on Breaking Bad, Anson Fullerton on Burn Notice, Jake Abernathy on Bates Motel, Win Duffy on Justified, and that's all before this. He had a legendary TV career before this. He's still out there doing stuff. I've seen him everywhere growing up and also as a Muppet. <laughs> and as Barbara Beaumont is the equally badass named Fiona Vroom. That's a good name. That rules. <laughs> Fiona Vroom at your service. That's like a noir name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's also apparently in a small part in My Struggle 3, the last episode of The X-Files. Oh. She plays young My Cassandra. Four is the last oh, oh, that's right. Okay, so this is a return from her because she's in My Struggle 3 as young Cassandra. Oh. Cassandra. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's interesting casting. Her first guest role is on Psych. She also has roles on Kyle XY, Human Target, Eureka, and God damn it, two episodes of Supernatural. <laughs> They're both 2010 episodes. One is Two Minutes to Midnight, and if they don't do anything with that Iron Maiden reference, I'm going to scream in a pillow tonight. It's a really good episode if I'm thinking, okay, caveat, I am pulling a lot of this out of my brain, and like... You're pulling an amazing amount of this I out of your brain. I think if I got some of these wrong, please be nice to me. We're fine. Um, don't worry about it. There's a lot of it. episodes, but I think that is the episode when we first meet Death, and that is a dope scene, because that's like the the four uh, horsemen of the apocalypse like season and death fucking rules. And they meet in a pizza parlor in Chicago. <laughs> cool. Death loves junk food. Her that other makes sense. <laughs> her other episode is playing a dental assistant in you can't handle the truth. Also 2010. You looked at your computer. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm looking it up. Oh, it's just like a truth telling goddess. I don't really remember it. Yeah. She also played the character Lolani on an episode of Star Trek Continues of the same name. From clips, it looks like she's playing an Orion, which is really funny because she's also an Orion girl in Star Trek Beyond. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I love that. She's she would al- make a great Orion. They don't yeah. have to do anything with her hair. Right. She's also Pearl Andrews on True Heroines. Uh, which was a web series that she helped produce that kind of got her on the scene. She was Vicky Monroe on Bates Motel and was also in the Power Rangers reboot movie. She was also Wilson on Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. She's really good in that. That show is fraught because Max Landis is a piece of shit. And I didn't really know he was involved in that when I watched it. But it sucks because that show was really fucking good. She was good in that. Everybody that was on that. It was a really good show. Mm -hmm. But like 
you know, shit bags. Got to be shit bags. Mm-hmm. She's Sandy Kim on Altered Carbon. Also amazing on that. Carla on The Man in the High Castle, Hannah on the new Are You Afraid of the Dark, and most recently is Miss Gillies on Snowpiercer and Parker Banning on Family Law. Great career so far. Cool name. She was born a month before me. So, like, keep going. Keep going. (laughs) Do do it for Bobby. I know it's an immortality episode. We're not going to think about our age. I believe in you. (laughs) Keep fucking going. (laughs) She's so good in this part. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is why, like, she has top billing over a TV legend, mm-hmm. basically. She's playing opposite Jer, who's done it all at this point, and really just really captivates the whole episode. Yeah. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, that's all of the Supernatural <laughs> guest stars I have for all you right. today. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time. <laughs> Until next time. <laughs> Stink. Thanks, Walter. All right, now for our overall thoughts. So each of these episodes obviously deal with immortality Mm -hmm. in different and fun and interesting ways. Fun and interesting is a fun and interesting way to describe that. (laughs) One is just something that happens. And then one is like we have to eat the bodies of we have to eat them and we have to eat them through our backs. (laughs) (laughs) Gross. But also they tie together in a weird way where they both have very – emotional final scenes yes where like two people who have been in love for a long time but are also co-workers have to like make these weird choices and confessions and one is very sweet and beautiful and one is maddening (laughs) but that one is also kind of maddening it's all maddening we also have the tie together too. bobby pointed this out while we were watching the x-files one where the main immortal character says to the cult member slash android have i ever lied to you and like yes if you're an immortal you're probably lying to almost everyone around you because like that's the whole deal or else you're gonna get brain sucked by the government (laughs) you can't let people know you're immortal it's true you can't the big brain suck the big brain suck (laughs) so yeah they clearly tie together i just they're both maddening (laughs) in different ways they both trigger stella in very specific ways Uh, as a casual fan would you recommend this (laughs) (laughs) no absolutely not (laughs) no i wouldn't recommend this to anyone (laughs) no i think if you're like i think if you are invested in the like relationship i think it's an important episode to watch once yeah i feel like the best way to watch this episode is to do a full series watch and be like at the end of the series basically yeah your first full series watch watch them all and then never watch requiem for (laughs) methuselah ever never ever watch this again if someone contacted me and was like hey i've always wanted to watch star trek and this episode's on tv i'd be like turn it off immediately run away run away (laughs) do not watch that you'll never want to watch another episode Uh, would you recommend this to a newbie (laughs) absolutely not that would be so a i wouldn't because it's horrific (laughs) it's awful it's the worst but also like you would miss all of the like I mean, I don't think it would be unenjoyable in the way that Requiem for Methuselah would be like, well, this show is the worst. (laughs) But it would just be like, I have no context for really any of this. And the cinematography is cool. And like the horror elements are cool. But like, I don't. Yeah, like Who's you said, their this, kid. <laughs> I mean, you are. I know, but I, I'm, you know, you have context, right? Yeah, but it's, it's like you said, these and are also. Lo- I chose to watch it all stupid out of order, <laughs> like an idiot. <laughs> but li- like you said, these are like two different episodes in one episode. Too. Yeah. So like one of them would be totally appropriate right. for a newbie, and the other one, everyone as a newbie, you'd be like, "What the fuck is happening here?" Yeah. I don't know if it would entice you to watch more, unless it just left you with so many questions that you're like, I guess I got to watch 10 seasons <laughs> to understand what's happening here. <laughs> what's a scene or moment you will forget? <laughs> How dare you ask me this question? <laughs> what's a scene or moment you'd like to forget? <laughs> Obviously the last <laughs> one. Uh, yeah, the, that whole last scene of Bones giving him this horribly depressing monologue, this wistful and depressing monologue about, like, you could never understand what love is like. Anyway, bye, la, 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 la. And Spock being like, fuck you. <laughs> I will do anything for this man. <laughs> like, ugh. Yep, I will never forget that. Never, never, never. I would like to, and I will not. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what's a scene from this you'll never forget? Man, 
Honestly, probably when the moment I realized it was an organ stealing like thing, like up top, I was just like, "Oh, okay." Ah. <laughs> but like emotionally, I, I, that final scene is like very like I have the context, but I also don't have the context. So I, I personally look forward to like coming back to this in like a full series rewatch, mm-hmm. and like I'm having big emotions about it now. But like, what will it mean <laughs> when I know what William even looks like? I don't. I've never Googled him. I have no idea who he, what he looks like. I know nothing about him other than the fact that he's their kid, and you guys say totally normal William as if it's a regular thing to say. <laughs> You'll get it eventually. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, but like honestly, the one that's probably gonna haunt my dreams is uh, like the opening scene of just like cracking and stealing. <laughs> oh, also the one where that <laughs> you know the kid gets eaten alive is pretty hard. Yeah. There's a lot of scenes that are burned into this brain box. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like a brain suck right now. <laughs> Should I check in with you if you have nightmares about this? Yeah, like we could do a nightmare corner yeah, next time. Go. We'll see. Uh, who are you shipping? I mean, obviously Kirk and Spock, but like uh, it's I, fraught. Yeah, it's fraught. I feel very <laughs> conflicted about it. it. Like it is a beautiful moment that he's like, I. How dare you say I don't feel love and would never do something drastic? Question. Do you think he would have done that without the bone speech? I don't know. Because like we talked about, he Kirk does want to forget. But I feel like it would have been more consensual. That yeah. it would have been like a conversation that they had. Like, I can tell that this is upsetting you. And as your first officer and you're my captain, like, I can help you alleviate this. But also, like... Jim would never say yes to that also. And so that's this like additional like croissant layer of this like fucked up thing. Yeah. And so I don't know. I feel like Spock would have wanted to have done it and would have maybe offered. But I don't know that he would have just non-consensually mind melded yeah. and sucked this memory away if Bones hadn't like provoked him into doing it. But what happens in... Three days when Bones, who loves to talk about his feels, shows up with, like, a bottle of, like, brandy and is like, Jim, let's talk about it. And Jim is just like, about what? Because they don't write a report about that stuff. They, like, leave all of the Flint stuff out. So there's not a paper trail about it. And Spock probably deleted some captain's logs. He probably was like, I know how to computer. I don't know. Do you think that Spock also deletes that from McCoy's memory? No. Also, deleting captain's logs is a huge offense in Starfleet. Yeah. Oh, boy. yeah but Spock's done that before, and I think. Spock actually does not care about the yeah, fucking Spock rules. Spock doesn't give a shit. Yeah. No. Uh, Vulcans cannot tell a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Wink! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I don't know if he would have done it without that. I just don't know how. Maybe maybe Bones is just like, okay, you want to ignore it? Fine. And just like hand wavies it. I also feel like Spock could just say to Bones, like, we can't discuss this with him. Yeah. And I feel like even though Bones is a dick to him in many ways, would take that seriously. Yeah. Like, okay, if you're going out of your way to tell me, don't talk to him about this, I feel like Bones would respect that at least. Yikes. Yikes a dikes. Uh. (laughs) I'm Mulder and Scully. (laughs) That's my answer. (laughs) That's what you're saying. It would be weird if I was like, you know, I'm not really feeling it. The vibes here are all wrong. <laughs> this beautiful discussion about like, I don't believe in God, but I I pray through you because you believe in God. Now nah, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> yeah, I'll relay your prayer candle. No, no, not for me. Not for me. <laughs> no thanks. Um, is this a fuck fine or a flop? I don't know. My instinct is like flop. Plus, fine minus. <laughs> I don't think I've ever given an episode that designation yeah. before. Because usually when it's a flop, it's like, this is a bad episode. Flop. Yeah. But this has the, the final scene is maddening. Yeah. Because without the final scene, it's a hard flop. It's like a, everybody's acting insane. What is happening? The crew is dying. This is an android. What are you doing? You're being so weird. What's yeah. happening? Everybody's being weird. And that final scene just like flips everything like yeah. and puts it in a whole new lens. Yeah. So, yeah. Fine minus flop plus. Maybe the only episode I ever give that designation to, to be honest. Woof. Where would you put this? <laughs> Objectively, it's a fuck. 
but I never want to watch it again. That's fine. <laughs> it's a good episode, both like it is a compelling and interesting, like monster of the week type thing. I think that the point that you made about it being a human monster is good. It's beautifully directed. The parallels that I didn't think about, but that are completely obvious is like the the like parallels of like the cult and the religion thing Juliet rips she's super cool <laughs> I love her and then like all of the like character stuff and the like emotions that they have and and the like confession that they have and yeah I think it is a very good episode it's just like hit a lot of things for me that I was like this is not fun yeah <laughs> I don't like this <laughs> now when you watch it the next time you'll have had 11 seasons to prepare yeah, honestly yourself. I might just fast forward to the final scene and be like okay this is what I need watch the one where they flirt in front of the other detectives fast forward through the rest of the episode yeah. and then watch the end yeah yeah I get it well, that's it. All I'm right. ready to put this episode to bed. <laughs> All right. You can find us on the internet. Follow us at NYD Productions on Twitter and Instagram and interact with the show using the hashtag Pod. You can find me at NYD Urgency on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter at Stella underscore Cheeks. And you can find me on Twitter at Haberdasher 9K. You can also email us at extrexpod at gmail.com with questions or comments. I actually have a ton of links for Immortal Bones because people saw that Carl Urban was Bones in the new ones and was like, hey, but what if he was also his character from Doom? God bless the internet because they are actually very good. I love the urban omniverse yeah, personally the as urban, well. There are so many good like yes. urban crossover stuff, like multiverse stuff where they like meet each other. There is like, yeah, the urban universe fucking rules. There's like a really good one that's a mirror universe one with like Doom Bones and Kirk. There's some, they're like, very good. And then you throw in like Judge Dredd as well and everything just gets yeah. very, very interesting. Yes. Right. Doom is the one that he like lives for a long time. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You mean Doom with Dwayne the Rock Johnson? Yeah, with Dwayne yes. the Rock Johnson. Yes. And if you want more special behind the scenes action like our script notes, outtakes including three minutes of exasperated sighs and yelling, <laughs> extra podcasts like unofficial channels and access to our Discord, then check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash NYD Productions, where you can get all of that and more for only a dollar. dollar. Stella Cheeks no longer trusts me. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and to tell your friends. We find this nerdy shit is better when it's shared. We'll see you next episode for The Invasion. Haters episode. In the meantime, believe boldly. Seek truth. Ship proudly. Extrex is created and written by Stella Cheeks, Aaron Klein, and Bobby Hoffman, and produced by Bobby Hoffman for NYD Productions. Our show theme is Alien Spy by Ionix, and our show art was made by Jonathan Curtis. 